everyone, and welcome to the Pash On Podcast. Let's get started with your host, Brian Pash. Hi, this is Brian Pash, and welcome to another podcast. On today's show, we have Frankie Russo. He's the founder <laughs> of 360 Auto. Frankie, thanks so much for taking your time and sharing the spotlight with me today on automotive marketing. Oh, thank you, Brian. I'm so glad to be here today. So, Frankie, we have had a number of conversations about digital marketing together, but you know, I've been out talking about digital marketing for years. For dealers who are not familiar with 360 Auto, would you give them a little background on what the company's core uh, mission is in the automotive industry? Yeah, that's great. So what our mission is and, and what drives a lot of uh, what makes us today has really started uh, 15 years ago. And what, what we've tried to do from the beginning is really put the dealership's problems at the forefront. So we don't really spend a lot of energy trying to focus on, you know, what problems do we have? We put our, all of our focus on what are the true problems that a dealership faces, especially around getting uh, information and attribution and real data for where their money is going when it comes to what marketing and advertising. And so that's really been a huge focus for us. That's what we were founded on originally. And our passion today, uh, we've not forsaken uh, the, the value and, and our original goal of having offering true attribution to dealership. But what we have done is we've allowed ourselves to evolve and partner with dealerships in a way that really gives them the type of growth that they're looking for by utilizing big data and automation in unison with attribution and other tools that we built originally to help dealerships really kind of understand and break apart what's really going on with all of their marketing efforts. Well, Frankie, that's exactly what I hear from dealers. They know that they're spending more and more each year on digital marketing. They're trying to connect those digital marketing investments to sales. But most of the industry today, in 2019, it's sad to say 19 years after Google Ads was first introduced, 19 years of spending and increasing uh, spend on digital advertising year after year, dealers still have a challenge of connecting those views, those clicks, those visits to an actual sale. So let's break this out a little bit. One of the biggest conversations I think today is the idea of big data or anonymous shopping data. Uh, I'm going to handle this straight straight on. There's a number of companies that are offering dealers the ability to get some information on the consumers who visit their website that don't fill out lead forms. So Frankie, from your perspective, uh, can you explain to dealers in a simple way how this is being done? Because when a dealer says, hey, I'm getting 30,000 visitors a month to my website, but I'm only getting 300 leads, it drives them crazy what have you found, That's Frankie, right. on all the claims out there? Is it fact? Is it fiction? If it's, is it hype? Is it reality? And, and what type of expectations can dealers have in working with companies like yours? Yeah, Brian, that is a great question. The first thing when you're talking, all I could think of was snake oil. So I, I'm going to leave all the snake oil out of the conversation. How about that? Yeah, that's perfect. And, and there's a ton of it. Okay. So first of all, there's no magical new way that people can mysteriously or companies can mysteriously identify all the anonymous shoppers. Um, obviously that's the Holy grail. Everybody wants to know who are these shoppers or browsers on this, on these websites so that we can then kind of see how that information ties back to multiple touch points in, in let's say a path to purchase model, or ultimately did this person buy a vehicle? or buy a product from them or do parts of uh, service with them. So that's really kind of what everybody's pushing to do. And, and I can tell you, the cool thing is, uh, Brian, there are new ways now where we can identify more 
of these quote unquote anonymous shoppers. However, we're nowhere near and, and with the privacy laws that are uh, starting to come out may never be there where we can fully understand every single browser who they are. So it's not even, uh, it's the same kind of concept of, of like, I know that half my advertising is working. I just don't know which half. Anyone who comes out and says they can tell you the other half is obviously not going to be someone you want to do business with because it's not possible. But if they can incrementally show you another three or five or 10% of the half, and maybe you can get to, I know, 60% of what's working, that's something that we are pushing towards. So when you think about this idea of anonymous shoppers, there's, there's a, a couple different ways to identify an anonymous shopper. The number one way is with their IP address. So if there's an IP address that's available, um, there is sometimes uh, certain actions that are taken once they've come to the site that you can memorize or uh, log, if you will. So you can save that information um, for a later time at which we can identify who that person is. But ultimately, there's there's only a couple of ways that I've seen it work well is it, with IP addresses, it's a little bit hairy because there's a lot of different ways that Wi-Fi routers and mobile users uh, have multiple people on the same IP address. So there's no perfect system for it unless, however, the person identifies themselves in some way. So one model that we've utilized is, is where if someone is actually filling out, like, let's say, like a form or typing in some sort of information, we're able to identify from those actions and keystrokes exactly what uh, that IP address was doing. And that helps us then log for later use what they do afterwards. So when, they, especially if, let's say they return for any reason after we've found some identifier like an email address or a phone number. But even then you still have to have some sort of uh, identification that they've done to be able to see uh, the browser data. Now, the other way that, that works well is if you've got information on a person already, for example, like with an email system or a CRM system, and that person then visits the site from the uh, email blast or something like that, that's all another way that we've been able to identify them because we already knew who their email address was, and then we were able to see their IP once they got to the site. But there's no magic way to fully identify and be completely uh, accurate. A lot of the systems out there, and I know you asked for a simple answer, so I'm probably going too long, but uh, <laughs> I'll just say, <laughs> I'm gonna say one other thing and then you can uh, do what you want with it. But so the other system that, that we've utilized, but again, it's, it's not a perfect system, is where we can predict uh, a physical location from an IP address, but it's not a perfect science. And it will have some, uh, room for error. We usually know how much room for error. For example, if it's how many meters plus or minus um, from a latitude and longitude, we can identify the person. And then if we know that person's physical address information, we can sometimes associate that back to the name. So there's a lot of different technologies that will allow for you to do it, but there's no one perfect way to get a full sample. And even when you do get a full sample, there are times when it's predictive that this is the person and not what we would call deterministic. Got it's it. more probabilistic, if you will. Understood, understood. So let's move into this <clears throat> next conversation. Since there's a lot of snake oil out there, and now about automation. One of the questions yes. that dealers have is say, Brian, I have this agency calling me and saying they have the best audience targeting or they have their own audience network or they partner with exclusive networks. And dealers have a hard time kind of sifting through that rubble mm -hmm. and understanding really who has the best targeting strategy. How do you advise dealers on these multiple companies that claim that, you know, they have the best audience targeting and that's why uh, a dealer should go with them? That's a great question. And, you know, what I've learned about any type of partnerships or any type of uh, vendor relationships, you know, it really boils down to what works for that dealership. So there's going to be times where, you know, I've seen, what I believe, and, it, and I'm not even talking about my own company, but I've seen vendors, and I won't name their names, that I believe is like, from what I could tell, they were the best. 
And I've seen that work for some dealerships and other dealerships, the same product not work for them. Um, so there's not really a one size fits all. I will say this. The, I think the most important thing, and, and I can tell you, this is the reason why um, we built ours the way we did. As a rule, Brian, I haven't been the first to market on, on a lot of things. So I've had to, I've had to approach everything um, as I've gotten into the technology world of auto, which is super competitive over the last decade. I've had to approach everything on like, how can I make this more customizable to the dealership? Because I'm, you know, the chances are, it, at least not at first, I'm not going to be able to go head to head with these, the, the juggernauts. So what I think is important about specifically audience targeting is, first of all, you know, what exactly does the dealer get um, when they, quote unquote, partner up with an audience? So I think it's important to know what a dealership gets. One of the things that, that I've seen work better than anything else, and, and I don't even know that it has as much to do with the audience targeting the algorithm for the audience targeting as much as it does the fact that coordinate when you can coordinate the bdc efforts with what you're also doing with digital advertising that is the strongest roi i've ever seen and the only way you can do that is if the audience quote unquote audience targeting is uh set up in a way that can be shared and obviously you've got to go through all the can spam and all those pieces but once it's scrubbed and clean and shareable so that the, the audience that you're utilizing for marketing and advertising is the same one that the BDC and the sales on the ground is also marketing to in, in, at the same time. Okay, so that, that's what I look for in audience targeting. And, and I don't know how, and it's just me personally, I don't know how I, anyone could ever claim that they have an exclusive data set um, it's in every, it's, unless they're just talking about a sing, maybe like a single geographical area. But if, if your company that's offering this to all of North America, I don't know how you would be able to make a claim like ours is completely proprietary. And, and to be honest, I'm not sure how much that matters. So we looked at that, right? And what we did, instead of saying, oh, well, we've got all these databases that are proprietary, it's like, I mean, I think you and I both know, Brian, for the most part, the databases that are being utilized are these public and sometimes sometimes proprietary databases. So you're going to have some variances. But at the end of the day, we're all going after a subset of a geographical area that we believe is an, an automotive and tender. Now, there's it's it's not so much the original databases that that are important to me as it is how you approach the data okay and that's a huge part of this and and i think that has to be i think that should be customizable based on the objectives of the dealership that and that's really key is it's, it's having a partner where you can approach the data strategically and not through this cookie cutter that uh model because we know that not every dealership is created equally so you've got to approach data the same way now when you talk about what you're doing with 360 Auto to really connect marketing investments with sales outcomes, can you give our listeners an idea of what that looks like in scale? For example, uh, let's just say, from my experience, a dealer might be spending twenty or thirty thousand on traditional media, another thirty to forty thousand on digital. That could be Google, Facebook, maybe some proprietary video pre-roll, uh, some OTT, and they have this marketing mix and they sell two hundred cars. If a dealer is using 360 auto, of those two hundred sales, how do you have a conversation with a dealer on which marketing channels are are influenced by that media buy versus someone who maybe is an existing customer and just walks in or you know somebody like truly has not you know seen a recent commercial huh? what can dealers expect because there's more and more companies out there saying hey we can help you tie marketing dollars to sales but what that means uh you know varies uh, greatly 100 percent. so this is how i approach that 
first of all, if you're going to be in the attribution business, I believe that you've got to have multiple models for attribution that you utilize. It's not one specific model. You've got to look at multiple models. And so I will tell you this, what we do when we look at those 200 dealerships, I mean, 200 deals from a dealership, we look at the mix based on what we know about the person. So one of the biggest things that, that has allowed us to have a much more robust conversation is that we look at both, both what's happening with the inventory and what's happening with the person. So we, we utilize two main attribution models in addition to you know, all the traditional KPIs and Google Analytics and whatnot. But there's two proprietary models that we had to create, and it was very expensive because we had to create our own version of Google Analytics that we put on each dealer's site. It's writing three, four, five million lines of code a day just to, of text to, uh, for us to be able to keep up with this analytics tool that we created. And the main reason we created it uh, was so that we could identify vehicle activity and user activity around specific vehicles. And then when they sold or they were a certain amount of time on the lot, we had a lot of color. And not only when the traffic was coming from our activities, what we did is we, we started mapping out all the different traffic that drove the VDP sale. Okay, so VDP sales has been a big part of our attribution model for a long time. Unfortunately, with the VDP sales, we don't see all of the lead data. So a lot of these dealerships, they're getting less and less leads and phone calls. And I, this is how I see it, and I'll see if you agree with me. The way I see it, the reason why, is because dealerships have gotten better and better at merchandising. That's correct. They don't, the, cons, the consumer doesn't need to call, and for God's sake, they don't want to. Nobody wants to identify themselves if they don't have to, to a dealership, because Lord knows what happens next. They're going to get calls and emails and basically borderline harassment. So nobody really wants that. And at the end of the day, it's drove leads and it's drove phone calls down. Now, what that has done is it's made it very difficult to do what I consider a direct sales match. So direct sales match is where, you know, obviously we've got all these phone numbers out there, these emails, and we're tying them back to the information in the DMS. So first of all, and I don't know if this goes without saying, but I don't believe any attribution model can be complete without having direct access to the DMS on an ongoing basis. That's correct. I Meaning mean, that at is least, the, at that, least daily, yeah. That that's, is the that's ultimate a, record of who bought. Right. And that not only tells us who bought, how much they spent, it's got all the color they need. So what I believe, first of all, I believe that you've got to have a multi-touch model of attribution. And it has to include more than just whatever you're offering. So from the day one, and, and I feel like this is where unknowingly I was in the same mindset as you with Vista Dash, but that is, you have to be what I consider agnostic so that you can look at all the pieces. At the end of the day, nobody wants to be, no dealership in their right mind is going to buy that all these deals just came from this one marketing source. When we all know that you consumers are looking at 20 plus different sources and tw they're having 20 plus interactions before they even walk into a dealership. So of course it's not one thing. And that's why it's so important to be able to be as robust as possible and bring that in. So what I've learned is that first of all, the leads and the, and the phone calls are not going to give you the full picture. The next picture is the VDP traffic that will give you some more color, but still not the full picture because again, we still don't have the who. And as we've talked in the past, Brian, the who is so important for dealerships because at the end of the day, every dealership wants to know, where's my money? That's I right. spent 100000 I spent 200000 Where's my money? And the fact is, dealerships get their money from one place, and that's from people. So with that being said, if I want to show a dealership, hey, where's my money? I've got to show them who are the people. Now, that's easier said than done. We already talked about how difficult it is to identify who all these people on the website are. You know, but that's why. And this is important. That's why it's so, so imperative that custom audiences are utilized in all of the marketing effort. It's so important. We, we are so blessed to have a moment in time where we can identify people for, in advance and, and, and decide that these are people that will buy vehicles in the next 90 to 120 days. And then do something with that information beyond just direct mail and email. Historically, 
when we identify quote unquote these audiences and we know who they are and we have their names and email address let's say and, phone, and maybe some physical address we're able to market to them using email and direct mail and i think what's important now is that we we have to continue to evolve that model to include this really large dollar amount these dealerships are spending on that is so easily uh inefficient things like search and social display video like you talked about those have to be in the same mindset of this really going after the most important audience which are the people that are actually going to buy in the next 90 to 120 days so frankie when we think of the opportunities out there when a, a dealer group works with 360 auto and you've had a chance to look at their marketing investments and start to make tweaks and uh, recommendations for improvement. Is there any general number you talk to a dealer? Because they're always asking me, especially as some of the economic headwinds are, you know, gaining momentum. Hey, if if I use marketing intelligence, if I use marketing automation with 360 Auto, if I really focus on a more data-driven approach with de direct connections for my DMS, what type of efficiencies would I expect to see? How, how do you talk to dealers to help quantify when you're encouraging them to rethink how they market? What, what's the potential for them as far as savings or you know, improvement, you, you come in, what, what kind of lift could they expect? That's a great question. And I will be honest with you, Brian, when I talk to dealerships about a potential partnership, I'm focused a lot less on, okay, look, if you do this deal, you're going to save 15% or more on marketing. You know, it's, there's, it's not really a Geico approach per se on savings. However, what we do focus a lot of energy on is market share. And what I mean by that is conquest. And so, you know, we look at conquest as our main objective. Okay. And there's two types of contest conquest that we focus on where we would consider pure conquest, which is someone who hasn't bought or serviced or bought any parts or done anything. And they're completely out of the DMS or service conquest, meaning they've done parts, service accessories, but never bought a car. That is the true focus. Of, of what we believe is the most important. And, and we do, of course, like many other companies and anybody running television or anybody running any advertisement that's, that's got loose targeting, we're going to market to a dealership's customer. A lot of dealerships are like, well, why would I want to market to them? And they're going to buy anyway. And most of the time what I'll tell them is, you're right, they will. But as you know, timing with what you deal with, with your inventory and with your floor plan, and with your commissions that you're trying to pay your people, timing is very important. So they may buy, but the question I always ask is when? So I, I always like to, to put that out there because to buying now and helping be a part of influencing someone who will buy in the future to buy now, I think is valuable. Do I think it's as valuable as, as growing market share? No, but I do think it has a value. So I, I like to include both. I'll tell you, Brian, since we started this new model, which is really kind of the 4.0 version of our platform, last year we released uh, the 4.0. And since we've started doing this new model, we're seeing 60, 70, 80% of the, the, the matched sales, whether that's a direct match or that's what we call a view through sale, which we probably should talk about in a minute. But the view through sale or direct sale, either way, we're seeing 60 to 80% of the audience that we pre-identify. So in advance of, of starting it, we, we identify 5, 10, 15, 20,000 what we call auto targets. We're seeing 60 to 80 percent of those matches at the end of the, each month as conquest, either service conquest or pure conquest, but these are people that have never bought before. And that's really the data that's driving us. And what's what we're using to continue to to, to tweak how we utilize the data we're getting from the DMS and the CRM and the inventory mix and the website and coupling that with the big data information we know about these databases specifically in the area of responsibility for that dealership and all these different touch points like credit and previous purchase history, whether that's just consumer purchases or automobiles and their uh, real estate information, all of that 
comes together with the dealership's first party data to create a very unique data set. And so what we, we kind of use that as our north. The auto target and the, and the audience, that's our north. Everything else is detailed. No, so I, think, when, I, when, so the, I, I think that the short story is, uh, yeah, well, the short story is this. To answer your question, I don't, I don't look at, I don't ever talk to dealerships about a cost cut, cost cutting, like, hey, go with 360 auto to, co- to cut cost. But what I focus on is that, you know, obviously go with 360 auto to grow your market share. Well, I think that's what uh, is a unique value proposition, although it sounds so fundamental. I don't hear many people say that their strategy is to grow market share. I I know people say, hey, you're going to sell more cars. You're going to sell more cars. Like, well, how? Uh, well, you're just going to sell more cars because our audience is awesome or our targeting is better. And, and, and of course, some of those statements are true. But I like the idea that if you go into a dealer and say, our, our strategy is to grow market share, dealers pay tremendous attention to market share. So if, if you are moving market share, that's really what they care about because that's what the OEM cares about. Um, so that's very interesting that the, 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 the approach is very much aligned with what the dealer and the, uh, OEM want is I, I, I need to grow market share in my region. And, and to be honest, Brian, it's not, it's not by accident or because we have all this insight on the trades or anything other than when we built this, we built it with dealership. Like that's, that's all it is. All it's not, there's nothing magical about this we 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 tried to approach this actually from a very practical standpoint and we we built a big robust piece of tech that does everything that you would want it to do but based on what dealerships really are looking for what they really need help with and and i can tell you that the thing about market share is like okay that's that's a it's nice to say right and then everybody's like oh just increase your search and your your impression share will go up you know a lot a lot of guys out there that are selling search and, and we do a ton of search, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm not dogging anybody who sells search. We do a lot of search, but there's this idea that, well, if you just buy all the impression share, you know, and dealerships, they, they look at that. They're like, Oh, I need to get a hundred percent market share on my search. That's going to get me there. And, and I think there's a lot of what I would consider vanity ideas or vanity KPIs out there that, that are, you know, hooking dealerships in uh, on this false, like idea that impression share is some sort of way to get market share. But at the end of the day, I think it's quite simple. I mean, market share is conquest deal. Yeah. And, and I think that in a world where, you know, honestly, dealers are never going to be experts at validating audience claims or attribution models. Uh, they're not going to be able to audit someone's sales match strategy. What they are going to be able to know if this net new sales uh, that are coming into their dealership are truly first time buyers or if their market share is growing. I mean, those are very real numbers that dealers can sink their teeth into. And and I know, Frankie, you're going to be at the upcoming Automotive Analytics and Attribution Summit. This type of conversation of really connecting marketing to the outcomes that dealers want is the whole theme of the show. Uh, What are you looking forward to most sharing with dealers at that show about where we are today in the marketing ecosystem. Yeah, I am very passionate about this, like yourself, and I'm super excited about changing the way that we think about the data. And the most important thing that I've I've come to realize in this journey is is this concept of starting with the end in mind. And one of the things you just mentioned, I feel like we're pushing the envelope on because you're like, well, there's no way to really audit the audience against the sales and whatnot, but but what if there was? And that's one of the things that we want to talk about it because one of the things that is fundamentally different about our approach is that we share the same information and not just contact information, but all the previous interactions and purchase history and, and uh, lead history and all that for each individual auto target in, at the beginning. So if you start with that in mind, and you, get, and you share that with the dealership team, and they can also be a part of that journey, 
when it when you do come back around and you're talking about attribution, it's a completely different conversation. So when you start with the end in mind, it makes the conversation at the end really different, very practical and very real and actionable. And that's really going to be the focus of, of what I share uh, when we get there uh, in November. Great. Well, you know, Frankie, I like to introduce dealers automotive innovators and leaders who are trying to solve the problems that dealers have. And, and that's why I like you started with that, Brian. We founded this company uh, to solve a problem that dealers have. And I will tell you that most dealership managers I talk to do not have any reliable reports or trust that they can connect marketing dollars with outcomes. They want to grow market share for sure. They want to sell more cars for sure, but they don't really feel they have any control of the levers. You know, one month the sales might be great. The next month the sales are, you know, down significantly. They haven't changed anything in the marketing. They're scratching their heads. So I love the fact mm -hmm. that there are companies working to develop uh, data models, marketing automation, uh, more intelligent reporting that aligns with what they can understand. Because too many products, I think, are talking over dealers' heads. Absolutely. That is, and we found ourselves right there two years ago. That's why we had to simplify it to like, okay, if we can't talk about the people that are involved in the audiences and the people that are buying this stuff, then we shouldn't even be talking. And so we spent a lot of time kind of simplifying. It's interesting. Our, our system is more complex than ever, but when I look at great softwares they don't require a lot to explain them and that's really been my passion over the last few years i had to go back to the drawing board because it it was it was in an effort to try and be cutting edge and to be niche and to be different we our product was it was too much to even really kind of understand and at the end of the day a dealership's just like well shit i just want to well, excuse me <laughs> well darn i just want to make money you know what i mean or darn i just want to i just want to be successful and I don't really understand all this other stuff. And so it ends up just kind of going away. Well, you know, Frankie, we, we uh, you know, f had found obviously that we followed similar paths when I first developed Vista Dash. You know, as a data junkie, I thought dealers would be excited. And really, dealers were excited to have some trusted insights into their data, but they really didn't want to spend time in dashboards and, and looking at trends. That's they really it. wanted actionable data. And, and that's what I like about the approach you're taking is using automation, using machine learning, using these complex data sets, but then making it very easy for a dealer to understand uh, what they're getting and then see the results. Frankie, for dealers who would like to learn more about your platform, what's the best web address and phone number they can use to uh, set up a demo? Perfect. Yeah. So the web address that uh, you can learn more about the company is 360.auto. Okay. So that's so www.360.auto. Uh, right? It's one of those new auto domains. It's, yes, that's right. The trying to buy 360 uh, was, I don't know, a million dollars. So <laughs> I figured I'd save my money and go with dot auto. So it's, it's www.360.auto. And um, as for the phone number, it's so funny. I have to look it up. <laughs> no problem. That's easy. Listen, everyone who has uh, phone numbers or tracking numbers on their website, you know, are not expected to remember it all. But uh, what's the best phone number for someone to give you a call at? Yeah, 337-408-3254. Great. Frankie, thank you so much for your time today. I'm looking forward to hosting you and the dealers who are using your platform at the Automotive Analytics and Attribution Summit. Dealers who are listening to today's podcast and are saying yes to any of these questions. Do you want better visibility into your marketing outcomes? Do you want to increase your market share with levers that you understand? Do you want more efficient advertising that is reliably executed? If you've answered yes to any of those questions, then the Automotive Analytics and Attribution Summit is for you because we're bringing industry leaders together, technology innovators. We're having the largest gathering of data-driven 
vendors and speakers to talk about the things that Frankie identified and I've written about, which is how do we make our marketing more efficient? How do we align our marketing dollars to sell more cars more efficiently? How do we know what's working? So Frankie, I'm excited to have you part of the program, your workshop, and I look forward to staying in touch with you and your team as the company grows to solve more problems for dealers in a digital age. For everyone who's listening to this podcast for the first time, you should know that every Monday we release a new podcast. So just go to brianpash.libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com, or you could just search Pash On Podcasts on the Apple iTunes uh, app to listen to the podcasts online. Thank you so much for investing your time, and we look forward to spending more time with you next week on another podcast session.